Hollywood, California, Monday, September 14th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Ruth Chatterton and Brian Ahern in Sir James Barry's play, Quality Street. Lux presents Hollywood with Ruth Chatterton, Brian Ahern, Kathleen Lockhart, Mervyn Leroy, and Harold S. Bouquet. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our musical director, Louis Silvers. This hour in Hollywood comes to you with greetings from the makers of Lux Toilet Soap. Our welcome also goes to the distinguished audience gathered here in our theater on Hollywood Boulevard, which includes the following Boston dramatic critics who have just returned from Santa Cruz where the picture made of Salem starring Claudette Colbert is being filmed. Marjorie Adams, Peggy Doyle, Helen Eager, Prunella Hall, Eleanor Hughes, and Don Messenger. And a hearty welcome also to our old friend, Al Jolson. We hope our program brings you as much pleasure as your presence brings to us. We wish you could visit the homes of Hollywood's glamorous stars. We wish you could visit their dressing rooms at the famous motion picture studios. For then, you could see for yourself that nine out of ten of our most beautiful actresses protect their flawless complexions with Lux Toilet Soap. Lovely women everywhere prefer Lux Toilet Soap because they know its active lather removes cosmetics thoroughly, assures daintiness, and leaves the skin clear, smooth, and delicately fragrant. Order some tomorrow. It's so inexpensive that everyone can use Hollywood's favorite beauty care every day. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater, ladies and gentlemen... Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Given a microphone or a monoplane, Ruth Chatterton and Brian Ahern are completely at home on the air. Miss Chatterton has the distinction of being the first actress to make a solo flight across the United States, and Mr. Ahern has just obtained his pilot's license. Sir James Barry, who wrote tonight's play, Quality Street also dabbled in aviation. Recalling Peter Pan, you will remember that his character, Wendy, had a great deal of flying to do. To stop children who loved the story from trying to follow Wendy's example, Sir James wrote a warning to them that uh, before they could fly, it would be necessary to sprinkle them with Peter Pan's magic dust. But to rise in the world, tonight's stars needed no magic dust. Brian Ahern was acting on the English stage at the, uh, when he was only five, while Ruth Chatterton, at 13, gave a song recital in Carnegie Hall. For her first job in stock, Ruth earned $10 a week, six of which went to the landlady. Soon after, Henry Miller spoke to Ruth on the telephone and gave her the lead in his new play without even having seen her. She was only 17 then and totally unknown. But at the end of her opening performance, she won an ovation that lasted 10 minutes. Brian Ahern, at the age of 10, went to London and lived all alone, just so he could study acting. After leaving college, he rose to immediate success in England and Australia, while his performances in this country, in the Barretts of Wimpole Street and Romeo and Juliet, will long be remembered. We hear him tonight in the role of a young physician, Valentine Brown. The part of Phoebe Throstle will be played by Miss Chatterton, and that of Susan, her spinster sister, by Kathleen Lockhart. And now, the lights overhead in the Lux Radio Theater fade to pinpoints, then go out. Footlights flash on, and the curtain rises on Sir James Barry's famous play, Quality Street, a gentle love story of the early 19th century, when ladies were incredibly prim and gentlemen endowed with a chivalry little known to our present generation. Quality Street stars Ruth Chatterton, and Brian Ahern with Kathleen Lockhart. It is the winter of 1805, and Napoleon's greed for empire casts a threatening shadow over all Europe. We're in the home of the Mrs. Susan and Phoebe Throstle on Quality Street a refined but by no means wealthy district in an English town. As the curtain rises, Miss Susan Throssell 
Phoebe's old maid sister, is knitting in the parlor. We hear the sound of the doorbell, an old-fashioned full bell, whose continued tinkling surprises Miss Susan. Phoebe! Phoebe, answer the bell, please. Yes, ma'am. Oh, come in, Miss Phoebe. Thank you. Oh, Susan. Susan, I'm so excited. I should think so. I thought you were going to pull that bell out by the roots. What's happened? Patty, will you please take my bonnet and fur tip it into the bedroom? Yes, miss. What is it, Phoebe? Just a minute. I didn't want Patty to overhear. Susan, I have met a certain individual. Not Mr. B.B. Yes. My dear, you're trembling. No. Oh, no. Oh, yes, you put your hand to your heart. Did I? Has he proposed? Oh, Susan. Then what? I think it is too holy to speak of. Even to your sister? Susan, I was visiting an unhappy woman whose husband has fallen in the war against Napoleon. When I came out of her cottage, he was passing. Yes, Phoebe. He offered me his escort. At first, he was very silent. We know why. Uh, please not to say that I know why. Suddenly, he stopped and swung his cane. You know how gallantly he swings his cane. Yes, indeed. He said, I have something I am wishful to tell you, Miss Phoebe. Perhaps you can guess what it is. Go on, go on. To say I could guess, sister, would have been unladylike. I said... Please not to tell me in the public thoroughfare, to which he instantly replied that I shall call and tell you this afternoon. Phoebe! Susan, to think that it's all happened in a single year. The village doctor, such a genteel competency as he can offer, such a desirable establishment. Oh, I had no thought of that, dear. <laughs> what a romantic name. Mr. Valentine Brown. Do you remember when he first called? At the tea table, he humorously passed the case basket <laughs> with nothing in it at all. Oh, <laughs> he was very amusing from the very first. I'm thankful that I have a sense of humor, too. I'm exceedingly funny at times, am I not, Susan? Yes, indeed. You know, he is absolutely fearless. Susan, he has smoked a pipe in this very room. Oh, smoking is indeed a dreadful habit. But there is something so dashing about it. And now I shall have to live alone. Oh, no. I cannot bear to leave this room. My lovely blue and white room. It is my husband. Uh, Susan, you must make my house your home. You see... You see, I have something distressing to tell you. What? You alarm me. You know Mr. Brown advised us how to invest half of our money. I know it gives us 8%. So why it should do so, I cannot understand. But very obliging, I'm sure. Susan, all that money is lost. Lost? Something burst, dear. A bubble, I believe they called it. And then the officers of the company absconded. But Mr. Brown... Oh, I haven't told him yet. He might think it was his fault. How much have we left? Only 60 pounds a year. So, you see, you must live with us. Oh, but... But Mr. Brown... If he, he is not proud to have my Susan live with us... I shall say at once, Mr. Brown, the door. Dear Phoebe. That, that knock. He never rings. He knocks. So dashing. So imperious. Uh, Susan, I think he kissed me once. You think? I know he did. He was squiring me home from the concert. It was raining, and my face was wet. He said that was why he did it. Because your face was wet? It doesn't seem a sufficient excuse now. Oh, Phoebe. Before he had offered marriage, I feared it was most unladylike. Oh. oh, good afternoon, Mr. Brown. Good afternoon, Patty. Ah, Miss Susan, how do you do, ma'am? And Miss Phoebe? Miss Phoebe of the pretty ringlets? Yeah, how are you? Always so dashing. May I sit on this chair, Miss Phoebe? I know Miss Susan likes me to break her chair. Indeed, sir, I do not. Phoebe, how strange that he should think so. But the remark was humorous, was it not? <laughs> how you see through me, Miss Phoebe. Ah. So, I am dashing, eh, Miss Phoebe? A little, I think. Well, I've something to tell you today, which I really think is rather dashing. Oh, dear. I say, Miss Susan, you're not going before you know what it is. Oh, I know, Mr. Brown. Susan! Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I can guess. I mean, oh, please, Phoebe, you explain. Oh, so you both know. And I've flattered myself for such a secret. Am I to understand that you had foreseen it all, Miss Phoebe? Nay, sir, you must not ask that. <laughs> Anyhow, it was you who first put it into my head. Oh, I hope not. Your demure eyes flashed every time the war was mentioned. The war? The 
war? Mr. Brown, what is it you have to tell us? That I have enlisted, Miss Phoebe. Did you surmise it was something else? You are going to the wars? Mr. Brown, is this a jest? Not at all. I've chafed for months. I want to see whether I have any courage. I think you have done bravely, Mr. Brown. I leave tomorrow for the barracks in London. So this is goodbye. I shall pray that you may be preserved in battle, Mr. Brown. And uh, will you write to me when occasion offers? If you wish it. With all the stirring news of Quality Street. It seems stirring to us. It must have been merely laughable to you who came here from a great city. <laughs> you delicious, Miss Phoebe. <laughs> when I first came here, I felt sorry that one so sweet and young should live so gray a life. I wondered whether I could put any little pleasures into it. Oh, you mean the picnics we had together, chaperoned by Miss Susan? <laughs> oh, that was only how it began. Soon I knew that it was I who got the pleasures, and you who gave them. You have been to me, Miss Phoebe, like a quiet, old-fashioned garden, full of the flowers that Englishmen love best, and because they have known them longest. The daisy that stands for innocence, and the hyacinth for constancy the modest violet, and the rose. When I am far away, ma'am, I shall often think of Miss Phoebe's pretty soul, which is her garden, and I shall shut my eyes and walk in it. May I come back in again? Have you... Is it... Why, Phoebe, you seem so calm. Susan, what Mr. Brown is so obliging to inform us is not what we expected. Not that at all. He's enlisted for the wars, and he came to tell us goodbye. Going away? Am I not the ideal recruit, ma'am? A man without a wife or a mother or a sweetheart? No sweetheart. <laughs> have you one for me, Miss Susan? Why, why, uh... <laughs> Susan, we shall have to tell him now. You dreadful man, Mr. Brown. You will say it is just like Quality Street. But ever since you told me earlier today that you had something to tell me, we've been puzzling over it, and we concluded that... That it was that you are going to be married. Oh, was that it? <laughs> so like, oh. so like women, you know. We thought perhaps we knew her. Oh. We were even discussing what we should wear at the wedding. I shall often think of this. Oh, I wonder who would have me. But I must be off. So, uh, God bless you both. You are going. We shall miss you very much, Mr. Brown. Oh, uh, there is one little matter that I forgot. Uh, that investment I advised you to make. I am happy it has turned out so well. It was good of you to take all that trouble, sir. Accept our grateful thanks. Oh, I am indeed glad that you are so comfortably provided for. You must remember, I'm your big brother. <laughs> well, goodbye again. Goodbye, Mr. Brown. A misunderstanding. Just a mistake. A mistake. Oh, Phoebe, my dear. Don't. Don't, Susan. Don't. He is a fiend in human form. Nay, don't say that either. He is a brave gentleman. The money. Why did you not tell him? So that he might propose marriage to me out of pity. Oh, but Phoebe, how are we to live with half our money gone? We could keep a little school for genteel children. Only, of course, I would do most of the teaching. You all mistress. Oh, Phoebe of the ringlets. Why, everyone would laugh. I should hide the ringlets away in an old maid's cap, and people will soon forget them. And I shall try to look staid and to grow old quickly. It will not be so hard as you think, dear. Oh, there are other gentlemen who were attracted to you, Phoebe, and you turned them away. I did not want them. No, oh, they'll come again, and others too. No. No, never speak of that to me anymore. I let him kiss me. You could not prevent it. Yes, I could. I know I could now. I wanted him to do it. Oh, never speak to me of others after that. Perhaps he saw that I wanted it and did it to please me, but I meant... I, I meant that I gave him the kiss with all my love. Sister, I could bear all the rest. But I've been unladylike. Mm. 
Before we continue with Quality Street, starring Ruth Chatterton and Brian Ahern, we want to take you to an attractive one-story house on one of Hollywood's numerous hills. A man and his wife and their pretty daughter live there. We'll say their name is Brown. And Mrs. Brown is saying... Peg's awfully late tonight. They were to shoot her big scene today. You know, sometimes I think she works too hard at this moving picture business. There she is, I guess. Now, don't scold her. Peg, you're late. Have a good day. Oh, Mother, don't ask me. We had to shoot that telephone scene 22 times. Seemed to me I was running up and downstairs all day long. Maybe you don't think that's work. <laughs> of course it is, but it's worth it. Now, calm yourself and let's have some dinner. Oh, I can't. Davy's coming for me at 8, and I can't pass up the coconut grove with him. Oh, dear, he'll expect me to be full of pep, and I'm so tired I could flop. I'll never make it. <laughs> But Peg did make it. She took a warm, fragrant, Lux toilet soap bath, just as screen stars do when they're worn out from too much work. A Lux toilet soap beauty bath makes you feel refreshed, alive, and, most important, its active lather sinks deep into your pores and frees them of impurities that may remain to choke them. When you use Lux toilet soap, you're sure you're dainty, certain your skin is sweet. Peg's found out that daintiness pays dividends in popularity. She knows that's why Davy says to her as they glide past at the coconut grove, Gee, Peggy, you are a peach. Let's stay until the music stops, hmm? Honest, I could dance forever when I'm dancing with you. Be sure you protect daintiness the Lux Toilet Soap way. Keep skin clear, smooth, dainty with this soap the screen stars use. Start today. And once again, Mr. DeMille. We continue with Quality Street. Starring Ruth Chatterton as Phoebe Throssell and Brian Ahern as Valentine Brown. Ten years have passed. Phoebe and Susan are now teaching school, and the once charming sitting room is a jumble of maps and blackboards. Miss Phoebe, her ringlets hidden under an old maid's cap, is seated at a desk, looking careworn and tired. From the classroom comes Miss Susan, looking very agitated. Phoebe, if a herring and a half cost three halfpence, how many for eleven pence? Eleven. William Smith says it's fifteen, and he's such a big boy. Do you think I ought to contradict him? May I say there are differences of opinion about it? Oh, no one can really be sure, Phoebe. It's eleven. I once worked it out with real herrings. Oh, Susan, Isabella's father insists on her acquiring algebra. What is algebra, exactly? Is it those three-cornered things? It's X minus Y equals Z plus Y and things like that. And all the time you're saying they're equal, you feel in your heart they're nothing of the sort. Listen, Phoebe. Huh. Yes. The music for tonight's ball. The ball. Oh, a gay evening for some people. We must not grudge their rejoicing, Susan. It is not everywhere that there is a Waterloo to celebrate. No, I was not thinking of that. I was thinking that he will be at the ball tonight, Valentine Brown. And we've not seen him for ten years. Yes, ten years. We shall be glad to welcome our old friend back, won't we, Susan? You're not going to the ball. No. Dancing is not for the village schoolmistress. But he might pay us a call. Oh, dear me, I must get back to the children. Good afternoon, Patty. Oh, sir, good afternoon. Uh, come in, sir. Who is it, Patty? It's Captain Brown, Miss Susan. Captain Brown. Captain Brown reports himself at home again. Oh, you call this home? <laughs> when the other men talked of their homes, Miss Susan, I thought of this room. Well, what's this? Maps, desks, blackboards? Why, it looks like a schoolroom. It is. Ah, uh, Hi, oh, it is still the same, dear room. Miss Susan, I rejoice to find no change in you. And Miss Phoebe? Miss Phoebe of the ringlets? I hope there'll be as little change in her. Phoebe of the ringlets, oh. Oh, Captain Brown, you need not expect to see her. She is not here. I vow it spoils all my homecoming. Susan, that dreadful Smith boy. Uh, oh, Captain Brown. Miss Phoebe... It is. is it you, Miss Phoebe? Yes. 
I have changed very much. I have not worn well, Captain. We, uh, we are both older, Miss Phoebe. Uh, uh, Phoebe, <clears throat> dear, uh, the cloth. I think you can dismiss them, dear. Uh, the back way, Phoebe. The back way, Susan, and keep them quiet. Uh, yes, dear. Teaching school is sometimes a trial, Captain Brown. The children are very dear. Oh, but... ma'am. If only you had, you had invested all your money as you laid out part by my advice. What a monstrous pity you did not. Uh, we never thought of it. You look so tired. I have the headache today. You did not use to have a headache. Curse those dear children. Nay, do not distress yourself about me. Tell me of yourself. We are so proud of the way in which you won your commission. Will you leave the army now? Yes, and uh, I have some intention of setting up a surgery and pursuing again the old life in Quality Street. <laughs> I've been here in such high spirits, Miss Vivi. The change in me depresses you. I was in hopes that you and Miss Susan would be going to the ball. I, I had brought cards for you to make sure. But now you see that my dancing days are done. Miss Phoebe, what a dull gray world it is. Phoebe, uh, I sent them off and asked Patty to make some tea. You will have some tea, Captain Brown. Oh, well, thank you, Miss Susan, but I think not. Uh, some other time, perhaps. Hmm? Oh, yes, of course. You've just returned. There must be many duties to perform. <laughs> oh, but just wait a few days. And then the, the dashing Mr. Brown will drop in as of old. And behold, Miss Susan on her knees once more, putting tucks into my little friend, the Ottoman. And Miss Phoebe... Miss uh, Phoebe... Uh... Phoebe of the ringlet. I have no ringlets now, Captain Brown. You, uh, you keep school now, ma'am. There are more important things than ringlets to be considered. Uh, well, uh... You will come again soon, Captain. Oh, I shall regard it as a privilege, Miss Susan. Good day, ma'am. Good day, Captain. Good day, Miss Phoebe. Good day, sir. I wish you very happy at the ball. Thank you. Phoebe. Susan. He thought me old. My dear. He thought I was old because I am weary. He looked so pityingly at me. How dare he look so pityingly at me? Because I've had to work so hard. Is it a crime when a woman works? Because I've tried to be courageous. Have I been courageous, Susan? Heaven knows you have. But it has given me the headache. It has tired my eyes. Alas, Miss Phoebe, all your charm has gone, for you had the headache and your eyes are tired. My eyes are tired because for ten years they've seen nothing but maps and death. Ten years ago I went to bed a young girl, and I woke with this spinster's cap on my head. No, oh, it isn't fair. This is not me, Susan. This is some other person. Oh, I want to be myself. Phoebe, Phoebe, you who've always been so patient. Oh, no. No, not always. If you only knew how I've rebelled at times, you'd turn from me in horror. Excuse me. I have a picture of myself as I used to be. I sometimes look at it. I sometimes kiss it and say, Poor girl, they've all forgotten you, but I remember. I cannot recall it. I keep it locked away in my room. My room. Oh, Susan, it's there that the Phoebe you think so patient has the hardest fight with herself. I've heard her singing as if she thought she was still a girl. I've heard her weeping. Perhaps it was only I who was weeping. But she seemed to cry to me, Let me out of this prison. Give me back the years you have taken from me. Oh, where are my pretty curls? She cried. Where is my youth? My youth, Phoebe. I'm going to my room, Susan. I shall show you the picture of Phoebe. The Phoebe who used to be. Miss Susan. Oh, oh yes, Patty. Here are the tea things, ma'am. Oh, thank you, Patty. But I don't think we shall have it just now. Uh, Captain Brown couldn't stay. Oh. Is Miss Phoebe to go to the ball this evening, ma'am? I, I'm afraid not, Patty. Oh, tis a pity, ma'am. Yes, ten years ago she might have gone. But now... Ah, oh, the pretty thing that she was, Miss Susan. Do you remember, Patty? 
I think there's no other person who remembers, unless it be Miss Willoughby or Miss Henrietta. Susan! Susan! Why? Why, Phoebe, what have you done? I brought you the picture of the old Phoebe, Susan. Miss Phoebe, is it, is it really you? It is, Patty. Please to leave us for a while. I wish to speak to my sister. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, Miss Phoebe. Phoebe, that dress you're wearing. An old one, Susan, that I've kept away all these years. Is it pretty? Yes, beautiful. And your hair, your ringlets, oh, they're just as they used to be, Phoebe. Yes. Oh, student, this, this is a picture of my old self that I keep locked away in my room and sometimes take out of its box to look at. How marvelous. Perhaps I should not do it, but it's so easy. I have but to put on an old gown and tumble my curls out of the cap. Sister, am I as changed as he says I am? You almost frighten me. You're so young, Phoebe. Oh, you're like a girl again. <laughs> like a girl. Listen, the music at the ball is calling to me, Susan. See, my curls have begun to dance. They're so anxious to dance. One dance, Susan, to Phoebe of the ringlet, and then I will put her away in her box and never look at her again. Uh, Ma'am, may I have the honor? Nay, then I shall dance alone. <laughs> Phoebe, there's someone at the door. Phoebe, stop your dancing and hear me. Someone is coming. No, 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 Patty. Not Miss Phoebe. I'm someone else tonight. I'm, uh, let me see. I'm my niece. The, the door, ma'am. The Go door. Go down to the hall window, Patty. Look out and see who it is. I did see Miss Susan. She's Captain Brown. Captain Brown? Oh, Phoebe, stop. Go upstairs. Nay, Miss Susan. Let him see her. I'll show him in. I'll not be here. I'm going to my room, Phoebe. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Come in. Captain Brown, come in. Thank you. Uh, if you'll just step in here, Captain Brown. Uh, thank you. Ah, good afternoon. I'll wager you didn't expect to see me so soon, Miss... Uh... Oh, I beg your pardon. Good afternoon, sir. I'm sorry, I... Uh... I thought it was Miss Phoebe. <laughs> no, sir. Tis me mistress, mistress's niece. She's on a visit here. Oh, <laughs> excuse me, ma'am. Uh, Patty, I obtained this bottle of medicine at the apothecary's for Miss Phoebe's headache. It should be taken at once. Oh, Miss Phoebe's lying down, sir. Uh, is she asleep? No, sir. I think she's wide awake, well, sir. Well, uh, it may soothe her. Uh, Patty, take it to Aunt Phoebe at once. Uh, yes, miss. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, perhaps I may venture to present myself, Miss, uh, Miss, uh... uh Miss Libby, sir. <laughs> I am Captain Brown, Miss Libby, an old friend of both your aunts. How do you do? I was sure you must be related. Indeed, for a moment, the likeness, uh, even the voice. Law, sir, you mean I'm like Aunt Phoebe? Everyone says so, and indeed, tis no compliment. Ah, uh, it would have been a compliment once. You must be a daughter of the excellent Mr. James Thrussell, who used to reside at Great Buckland. Uh, Miss Livy, you go to the ball tonight? Alas, sir, I have no card. I have two cards for your aunts. As Miss Phoebe has the headache, your aunt Susan must take you to the ball. You'll enjoy it tremendously, I'm sure. Oh, sir, do you think some handsome gentleman might be partial to me at the ball? <laughs> if that is your wish. I should love, sir, to inspire frenzy in the breast of the maid. <laughs> but I, I, I dare not go. I dare not. Good afternoon, Captain Brown. Ah, Miss Susan, I have ventured to introduce myself to your charming niece. I beg your pardon. Aunt call. Susan, do not be angry with your Livy. Your Livy, Aunt Susan. This gentleman says he's the dashing Mr. Brown. He has cards for us for the ball, Aunt Phoebe. Aunt Phoebe wants me to go. If I say she does, she will know she does. But my dear, my dear. I shall see to it, Miss Susan, that your niece has a charming ball. He means he'll find me sweet partners. Nay, ma'am. I mean that I shall be your partner. Aunt Susan, he still dances. Still, ma'am? Oh, sir, you are indeed dashing. Oh, nay, sir, please not to scowl. I could not avoid noticing them. Noticing what, Miss Livy? The gray hair, sir. I vow, ma'am, there is not one in my head. Oh, sir, dissuade her. Nay, nay, I entreat her. Auntie, think, my dear, think. We dare not. No, no, we dare not. But we will. My dear. No use to talk, Aunt Susan. I've fixed my mind. We go to the ball tonight. We shall be bright and gay and thoughtless and merry. And we shall dance for the dashing Captain Brown. (laughs) 
We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue shortly with Quality Street, starring Ruth Chatterton and Brian Ahern. Ambitious newcomers are not the only ones given screen tests. The most famous stars in Hollywood are frequently tested to see if they are suited to certain roles. Tests are expensive and are conducted with great care because they're the talent laboratory of the studio. The gentleman you are about to hear directs the tests at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studio. Twenty years ago, he worked for me as a property man. Leaving his job to serve in the war, he has since then been a writer and director. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Harold S. Bouquet. Let me first explain how we make a screen test. <clears throat> the person to be tested rehearses a scene from a play. Then in costume, she goes before the camera, and the scene is shot with as much care as is given a full-length picture. In testing a newcomer, we watch especially for these points. Does she photograph well? Can she act? And has she a screen personality? By that I mean, does she have the ability to convey to the audience what she's thinking as well as what she says? In casting a new production, we test established actors to choose the ones best fitted to balance the cast. I remember in one picture starring Joan Crawford, I had to direct and listen to 34 crooners before finding one who could act as well as he crooned. <laughs> You've certainly suffered for your art. I've always sympathized with a screen test director. He's probably the most unpopular man on the lot because every performer fears his camera. That goes for some of the biggest actors, too. I've seen them go to pieces and forget their lines when it's a test for themselves. On the other hand, they're always willing to help out a newcomer by playing opposite him, giving him confidence and support. Perhaps you've been told you're the image of Miss Greta Garbo or Mr. Robert Taylor. That won't help you pass a screen test. At best, you'll only be a good imitation. Be yourself. Develop your own dignity, humor, sweetness, or strength. The truth will out in your screen test. Clear, vibrant skin helps immeasurably to convey charm and life. A good way to achieve vibrant skin is by using soap and water. And, of course, the soap used so much here in Hollywood is Lux toilet soap. Now, perhaps you can tell the girls listening to this program... How to make their own screen test without a camera. Surely. Just check the following points. Have you an honest, natural smile? Do you keep your appearance attractive with lovely skin, clear, sparkling eyes, even, regular teeth? Is your voice pleasing? Watch your friends while you talk, and if they become restless, you can be reasonably certain your voice is irritating. Can you retell a story you think is funny and make other people laugh? If you can't, don't blame it on the story. Your timing ability and sense of dramatic values need developing. Do you use your hands gracefully? Is your posture good? Do you walk with a spring or a slouch? Let your mirror answer that. Do you keep your friends when you're financially embarrassed? If they don't drop away when you're unable to entertain them, you can be positive you have a personality that stands at least an even chance of success. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Harold. Back to our story, Quality Street, starring Ruth Chatterton and Brian Ahern. We're at the ball, where Miss Phoebe, disguised as her non-existent niece, Miss Livy, is trying to recapture her lost youth and attract the dashing Captain Brown. On a balcony overlooking the garden, Miss Susan is talking to Miss Willoughby and Miss Henrietta, the oldest and most maidenly ladies the town has to offer. Your niece, Miss Livy, seems to be enjoying herself, Susan. Yes, Miss Willoughby. She loves to dance. The young men are quite infatuated about her. Do you think so, Miss Henrietta? Ensign Blaze and Lieutenant Spicer have claimed her every dance. 
Uh, when the gallant Captain Brown has not. It is remarkable, Susan, how greatly your niece favors her Aunt Phoebe. Oh, yes, yes. Is it not strange, Miss Willoughby? We've often commented on that fact. And how is dear Phoebe, Susan? We have not seen her for nearly a week. Oh, she's poorly, Miss Henrietta. Very poorly. Oh, how sad. Miss Livy is your brother James' child, I believe you said, Susan. Yes, brother James' child. Strange. I cannot remember that your estimable brother ever had a daughter. I thought all the three were sons. Oh, no, no. Three sons and a daughter. <laughs> Surely you remember my speaking of little Livy, Miss Henrietta? No, Susan, I do not. The music has stopped. Your niece is coming this way. Oh, yes, yes. If you'll excuse me. Oh, are we not to meet her, Susan? Oh, yes, certainly. If you wish it. Of course. Don't come now. You've been down to the Lieutenant Spicer all day. Nay, 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 gentlemen, you must excuse me. I must speak to my aunt. Will you be long, Miss Libby? I shall try not to be. Then we shall try to wait patiently, ma'am. Come, Ensign. Farewell, Miss Libby. Farewell, ma'am. Farewell, gentlemen. Oh, Aunt Susan, I... Uh... Oh, my dear... Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. I, I didn't know you were engaged. Uh, Livy, my dear, uh, these are two old friends of mine. Uh, my niece, Livy, uh, Miss Willoughby, and Miss Turnbull. How, How do, do you do? do? How do you do? Excuse me, Aunt. But One I'm not moment, really... Miss Livy. May I ask how many brothers you have? Two. Two. I thank you. Oh, uh, that is uh, two excluding the unhappy Thomas. The unhappy Thomas? Yes. We never mention him. Mm, I think I shall go. Come, Miss Henrietta. Uh, yes, my dear. Good night, Susan. Good night, Miss Livy. Good night. Uh, good night, Susan. You think they suspect? I know they do. How could they help it? Why didn't you tell me they were here? I didn't know myself until they came and sat next to me. Oh, Phoebe, the scandal. You were schoolmistress, flirting outrageously with every younger man to the ball, and allowing them to propose to me, too. You didn't? Yes. Oh, who were they? Ensign Blades, Lieutenant Allen, and Major Linkwater. Baby, what is to be done? If Miss Willoughby and Miss Henrietta find out about these proposals, they'll tell all Quality Street. We can never open school again. We shall starve. That horrid, forward, flirting, heartless, hateful little toad of a Libby. Oh, it's not her fault. I <laughs> know who it is that has turned you into this silly, wild creature. That odious Cruel Valentine Brown. Hmm. Poor blind man. To weary of Phoebe. Patient, ladylike Phoebe. The Phoebe whom I have lost. To turn from her and then become enamored in a single night of a silly imposter like Miss Libby. Yes, he is infatuated with Libby. Susan, there's been a declaration in his eyes all tonight. And when he cries, adorable Miss Libby, be mine... I mean to answer with a, oh, law, how ridiculous you are. You're much too old. I've been but teasing you, sir. Oh, Phoebe, how can you be so cruel? Because he's taken from me the one great glory that is in a woman's life. Not a man's love. She can do without that. But her own dear, sweet love for him. He's unworthy of my love. That's why I can be so cruel. Oh, dear. Miss Libby. Oh, tis Captain Brown, Aunt Susan. Lord, Captain, why are you not dancing? Indeed, ma'am, it is because I have something of more importance to attend to. I wish to speak to you, Miss Libby. Uh, may I, Miss Susan? Oh, oh yes, Captain. Uh, Libby, uh, I, I think it's almost time we left. Uh, I'll go and fetch your cloak, dear. Thank you, Aunt Susan. Won't you sit down, Captain? Thank you. Hmm, you're looking rather grim, Captain. What is it you have to speak to me about? Miss Libby... You're an amazing pretty girl, ma'am. Oh, Captain. But you're a shocking flirt. Oh, oh Lord. It has somewhat diverted me to watch the men go down before you. Ah, oh, but I know you have a kind heart. And if there be a rapier in your one hand, there is a handkerchief in the other, ready to stanch their wounds. I have not observed that they bled much. The blades and the like. Oh, but one may, perhaps. Perhaps I may wish to see him bleed. For shame, Miss Libby. I speak, ma'am. In the interests of the man to whom I hope to see you affianced. Oh, please, to say nothing. I, I am feeling faint. Nay, nay, nay. We must have it out. Well, then, if you must go on, do so. Who is this happy man? As to who he is, ma'am, of course, I have no notion. Oh. Nor, I am sure, have you, else you will be more guarded in your conduct. But someday, Miss Libby, the right man will come. Not to be able to tell him all. 
Would it not be hard? And how could you acquaint him with this poor sport? His face would change, ma'am, as you told him of it. And yours would be a false face until it was told. This is what I have been so desirous to say to you. By the right of a friend. I see. Oh, it has been hard to say, and I have done it bunglingly. Ah, but believe me, Miss Livy, it is not the flaunting flower that men love. It is the modest violet. The modest violet? You dare to say that? Yes, indeed. And when you are acquainted with what love really is... Love? What do you know of love? <laughs> Why, ma'am, I know all about it. I am in love, Miss Livy, with a lady who was once very like you, ma'am. Not... Not... Oh, no. I hadn't meant to speak of it, but why shouldn't I? It'll be fine listen to you, Miss Livy. Ma'am, it is your Aunt Phoebe whom I love. You do not mean that. Most ardently. It is not true. How dare you make sport of her? Is it sport to wish that she may be my wife? Your wife? If I could win her. Uh, may I solicit, sir, for how long you have been attached to Miss Phoebe? For nine years, I think. You think? No, I, I want to be honest. Never in all that time had I thought myself in love. Your aunts were my dear friends. And while I was at the wars, we sometimes wrote to each other. But uh, they were only friendly letters. I presume the affection was too placid to be loved. I think that would be Aunt Phoebe's opinion. Yet I remember, before we went into action for the first time, uh, I suppose the fear of death was upon me. Some of them were making their wills. I have no near relative. I left everything to those two ladies. Did you? And when I returned and saw Miss Phoebe grown so tired-looking and so poor... The shock made you feel old, I know. No, oh, Miss Livy. But it filled me with a sudden passion of regret that I had not been killed in that first engagement. They would have been very comfortably left. Oh, sir. No, oh, I am not calling it love. It was sweet and kind, but it was not love. It is love now. No, it's only pity. It is love. You really mean Phoebe? Tired, unattractive Phoebe, that woman whose girlhood is gone. Well, impossible. Phoebe of the fascinating, playful ways, whose ringlets were once as pretty as yours, ma'am. Memories. Yes, that is the Phoebe you love. The bright girl of the past, not the schoolmistress in her old maid's cap. Ah, there you wrong me. For I have discovered for myself that the schoolmistress in her old maid's cap is the noblest Miss Phoebe of them all. When I enlisted, I remember I compared her to a garden. I've often thought of that. It is an old garden now. And the paths, ma'am, are better shaded. The flowers have grown old. They old-fashioned. smell the sweeter. Miss Lily, do you think there is any hope for me? There was a man whom Miss Phoebe loved long ago. He did not love her. Oh, he was a fool. He kissed her once. If Miss Phoebe suffered him to do that, she thought he loved her. Yes. Yes. Do you think that this makes her action in allowing it less reprehensible? It has been such a pain to her ever since. (laughs) How like Miss Phoebe. But that man was a knave. No, he was a good man. Only a little inconsiderate. She knows now that he has even forgotten that he did it. I suppose men are like that? No, Miss Libby, men are not like that. I am a very average man, but I thank God I am not like that. It was you. Did Miss Phoebe say that? Yes. Then it is true. It was raining, and her face was wet. You said you did it because her face was wet. I had quite forgotten. But she remembers. And how often do you think the shameful memory has made her face wet since? The face you love, Captain Brown. You were the first to give it pain. The tired eyes. How much less tired they might be if they'd never known you. You who are torturing me with every word. What have you done to Miss Phoebe? Do you think you can ever bring back the bloom to that faded garden? Oh, oh, I shall do my best. I shall go to her. Miss Phoebe, I will say. Oh, ma'am, so reverently. Miss Phoebe, my beautiful, most estimable of women, let me take care of you forevermore. Beautiful. 
No, Mr. Phoebe. Ah, ma'am. You may laugh at a rough soldier so much enamored, but tis true. Marry me, Miss Phoebe, I will say. And I will take you back through those years of hardship that have made your sweet eyes too patient. Instead of growing older, you shall grow younger. We will travel back together and pick up the many little joys and pleasures that you had to pass by when you trod that thorny path alone. Can't be. Can't be. Nay, Miss Phoebe has loved me. Did you yourself have said it? I did not mean to tell you. She will be my wife yet. Never. You are severe, Miss Livy. Ah, but it is because you are partial to her, and I am happy of that. I partial to her? I'm laughing at both of you. Miss Phoebe, Lord, that old thing. Silence! I hate her and despise her if you knew what she is. Oh, I know what you are. That paragon who has never been guilty of the slightest deviation from the strictest propriety. Never! That garden... Miss Livy, for shame! Your garden has been destroyed, sir. The woods have entered, entered it and all the flowers are churned. You false woman, what do you mean? I'll tell you. What faith you have in her? As in my God. Speak. I, I cannot tell you. No, no, you cannot. It is too horrible. You are too horrible, is not that it? Here is your cloak, dear. The carriage is waiting to take us home. Answer me, Miss Levy. Is it not that you are too horrible? Yes, that is it. Levy, horrible? Explain yourself, Captain Brown. Ma'am, I leave the telling of it to her, if she dare. And I devoutly hope that those are the last words I shall ever address to this lady. Ma'am, your servant. My love, my dear, what terrible thing has he said to you? Not terrible, glorious. Susan, tis Phoebe he loves. Tis me, not Livy. He loves me. He loves me. Me, Phoebe. Why, Miss Phoebe, home from the ball so early? Miss Phoebe has had a shock. No, Miss Livy's had a shock, a glorious shock that she richly deserved. Then you must have had a delightful time at the ball. And that's the main thing. Who can that be? Tis an imperious knock. A military knock. Tis a dashing knock. Maybe it's Captain Brown. Oh, he mustn't see me. Patty, don't answer the door till I'm out of sight. Susan, tell him Miss Libby's been taken suddenly ill. I, I, I can't see her. I, I won't see her. Oh, Patty, uh, have the ladies retired? I must speak to Miss Libby. Ah, oh, Miss Susan. Where is Miss Libby? Oh, oh sir, uh, you cannot see her. Uh, she's been taken with a sudden indisposition. She is ill? Where is she? Uh, you cannot see her. Uh, she, she's a death door. Oh, but then I must see her. As a physician, it is my duty. Oh, no, 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 no. Patty, where is Miss Levy's room? I shall go to her at once. No, 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 I beg of you. Uh, I shall rouse her and escort her to you. Good, and bring some heavy wraps and a shawl. She mustn't catch a chill. Yes, yes. Patty, why have these dear ladies been deceiving me? Why, whatever do you mean, sir? I have talked to Miss Willoughby and Miss Henrietta at the ball. I feel that their suspicions are correct. Oh, sir, what suspicions? Patty, there is no such person as Libby. Is there? Captain Brown? Miss Phoebe has been posing as Miss Libby, hasn't she? Uh, I, I, uh, well, uh, yes, sir. Why has she done this? It was you that began it all by not recognizing her in a ring just the last time you were there. Why has this deception been kept up for so long? Because you would not see through it. She thought you were infatuated with her when she posed as Miss Libby because she was so young and silly. Oh, it is infamous. It was all in playful innocence at first, but now she's, she's so feared of you that she, she's weeping her soul to death. That will be all, Patty. You may go now. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Captain Brown. Oh, oh, yes, Miss Susan. I am happy to inform you, sir, that Libby finds herself much improved. It is a joy to me to hear it. She's coming in to see you. Oh, I shall be happy to see the poor invalid. Come in, Libby, dear. Yes, Aunt. Oh, your servant, Miss Libby. How do you do? Allow me to help you to the couch, Miss Libby. No, no, I, I can walk alone. How do you think she's looking, Captain Brown? Mm, a little drawn. But I believe she will recover. Thank heaven. May I say, Miss Libby... It surprises me that you should be said to be like your Aunt Phoebe. Of course, you have the ringlets, but uh, Miss Phoebe is decidedly shorter and more thick-set. No, I'm not. I said Miss Phoebe. Oh. Oh, oh, yes. Well, Miss Susan, I think I could cure your niece if she is put unreservedly into my hands. I'm sure you could. Ah, then you are my patient, Miss Libby. It was but a passing indisposition. I'm almost quite recovered. Oh, nay, you still require attention. But I believe that your home is the best place for you. Mm, would that I could go. 
You are going? Yes, soon. Indeed, I have a delightful surprise for you, Miss Levy. You are going tonight. Tonight? Not merely tonight, but now. As it happens, my carriage is standing idle at your door, and I am to take you in it to your home. Uh, sir, I've, I decline to go. Oh, what a stubborn patient you are. Miss Susan, can't you persuade her? Uh, indeed, Captain, I cannot. Oh, well, then I must speak to Miss Phoebe. Oh, dear. Where is she? I, uh, I, I, I cannot tell. You don't know. Very strange. She is your aunt, is she not? Oh, sir, and I... you are her niece. Uh, uh, yes, her niece. And yet you don't know where she is. I cannot tell. Then perhaps, ma'am, I can help you. You, sir? Miss Phoebe, dear creature, is here in this room with us now. Oh, uh, she calls herself Miss Livy. Oh, but we know it's just in sport. And more to her own confusion than mine. Phoebe, he knows. Captain Brown, I, I will explain everything to your satisfaction. <laughs> no need for explanations. Miss Livy is no more. Good riddance to that charming little flirt. And now, Phoebe Flossel. Will you be Phoebe Brown? You know everything. And that I am not a garden? I know everything, ma'am. Except that. Then uh, the dictates of my heart enjoin me to accept your too flattering offer. Miss Phoebe, it is not raining. But your face is wet. I wish always to kiss you when your face is wet. Oh, sir. Kiss Susan also. The romance of Phoebe Frossel and Valentine Brown comes to its happy conclusion. But before our program concludes, Ruth Chatterton and Brian Ahern will be back at the microphone. When the late Theodore Roberts, one of the screen's great character actors was performing on the San Francisco stage, he took a liking to a young newsboy and got him a job in the play Barbara Fritchie. All the boy had to do was perch on the limb of a tree and shout, the Yankees are coming. During his performance, the lad took a bow. But it was a bow from the tree on which he was sitting which crashed to the floor with him, creating the biggest laugh in the play. From then on, he insisted he was an actor and for a $2 raise agreed to fall at every performance. That literally is how Mervyn Leroy crashed into the show business. Today, as producer-director at Warner Brothers Studio, he has to his credit such pictures as Tugboat Annie, Little Caesar, Five Star Final, I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang, and the great current hit, Anthony Advers. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mervyn Leroy. Thank you, C.B. My first job in pictures was in the wardrobe department for $12.50 a week. I thought I was getting into the movies, and I found myself in the cloak and suit business, so I quit. <laughs> then you managed to catch my brother, William DeMille, in a weak moment and convinced him you were a great cameraman. I remember the first picture you shot under his direction was all out of focus, which gave it a soft, attractive quality never seen before, and we decided you were a genius. But I was smart, so I quit being a, a genius. I got myself a job as an actor for you, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> Mervyn played the role for me in, in Triumph. The scene was in a canning factory. And among other things canned during the picture was Mervyn Leroy. Let's skip over that and just, just say I became a comedy constructor and then a director. You know, I always wanted to be a big director like you, C.B. Oh, thank you, Mervyn. It's those clothes you wear, those boots and those britches. Boy, <laughs> they got me. <laughs> why, then why don't you wear them? I haven't got a horse. <laughs> <laughs> then let me give you a plug right now. You did an excellent job on Anthony Adverse. It's a grand piece of work. I had a swell time shooting it, too, with one exception. When I was making the African scenes, I kept the cast at, at work for four days in the drenching rain. I, of course, sat in, in, in comfort under a big umbrella. When the scene was finished, Frederick March, Pedro Cordova, asked me, meekly, if that was all. Thanks, boys, I replied. No more rain. Oh, yes, yeah, said Freddy. That's what you think. And with that, he and Pedro poured a bucket of water over me. <laughs> Of course, they offered you a cake of luxe soap with it. That reminds me. You've been knocking me since this interview began, so knock, knock. All right, who's there? Luxe soap. Luxe soap who? Luxe soap that people haven't tuned out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they won't if you'll stop gagging. Now that you're a producer as well as a director, 
Would you have made any changes in Anthony Adverse? Just one. And that? I would have fired Mervyn Leroy. Good night and thank you. <laughs> Good night, Mervyn. <laughs> Last week, the national air races were held in Los Angeles. Tonight's leading lady sponsored one of the features, the Ruth Chatterton Air Derby for sportsman pilots. Brian Ahern planned to compete, but his motion picture contract forbids flying, and he found himself grounded on Quality Street. However, it's a one-way street that leads our stars right back to the microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruth Chatterton and Brian Ahern. <laughs> I really had no thought of ever flying, Mr. DeMille, but Ruth bullied me into a plane last year. Well, then I decided to take lessons until I knew how to fly around the field and land the plane, just to prove to her there was nothing in it. <laughs> While Brian was up in the air, a bug bit him. He's had the flying fever ever since. It's a bad case, too. But long before Miss Chatterton or I came to Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. DeMille was flying his own plane. And nearly 20 years ago, he first started the first air passenger service in the United States. It operated between Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego. Mm. Right now, my interests are in the other extreme. I have a diving apparatus. I'm doing a little exploring at the bottom of the, of the ocean. Do you ever dive, Ruth? Only in planes, Mr. Vanille. Oh, well, come down and see me sometime. <laughs> Gladly, but make the date soon, because you see, I think I'm leaving Hollywood this fall for a season on the New York stage. Brian is, too. And success to you both. Are you flying back? Of course, I always fly, weather permitting. I know of nothing more invigorating. It's almost as invigorating to put my ship down and step into a shower with Lux toilet soap. <laughs> Lux has flown with me all over the country. I'm never without a parachute or Lux. You can depend on either to save your skin. I'm particularly... <laughs> I'm particularly glad to have had you and Brian in a DeMille production before you left. I tried to get him before, but he was afraid of Hollywood. Well, Hollywood no longer terrifies me. But I still can't understand the autograph hunters. They ask me for my signature, but usually they haven't the slightest idea whether I'm King Solomon or Mickey Mouse. <laughs> So, Mr. DeMille, thanks for a grand show. Good night. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night, pilots. Happy landing. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Chatterton and Mr. Ahern. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Roy. In a moment, Mr. DeMille returns with word of next week's program. Mr. Ahern appeared on this program through courtesy of Samuel Golden Productions. He is now co-starring with Merle Oberon in the Samuel Golden picture, Covenant with Death. Mr. Leroy appeared through courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio, where he has just produced and directed Three Men on the Horse. Mr. DeMille, through courtesy of Paramount, Mr. Bouquet, Metro Golden Mayor, and Mr. Silver's 20th Century Fox, whose new picture, Ramona, was musically arranged by Mr. Silver. And now, Mr. DeMille. As a novel, as a play, as a motion picture, Trilby ranks as one of the classics of literature and drama. Next Monday night, we bring you this story of the little French singer and the hypnotist Svengali. Our stars, Miss Grace Moore and Mr. Peter Larry. This musical and dramatic event will mark the opening of the fall season of the Lux Radio Theater. With Miss Moore in the title role and Mr. Larius Sengali, I can assure you a performance worthy of the occasion. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us next Monday night in the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Trilby, starring Grace Moore and Peter Larry. Today... The motion picture industry suffered one of its greatest losses, Irving Thalberg. The Lux Radio Theater joins Hollywood and the entire nation in extending deepest sympathy to his wife, Norma Shearer, and his family. To Irving Thalberg, who has brought so many hours of happiness to people the world over, we dedicate these ten seconds of silence. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you. From Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. What's that sound? That's the sound of downy, unstoppable scent beads going into your washing machine and giving your clothes freshness that lasts all day long. 
There it is again. It's like music to your ears or more like music to your nose. That freshness is irresistible. Let's get a Downy Unstoppable bottle shake. And now a sniff solo. Nice. Get six times longer lasting freshness plus odor protection with Downy Unstoppable's in-wash scent beads. 